Now they were wondering, a Negro attacked her. Maybe we are missing something. Maybe there is something interesting in her. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. Today we are going to look at a very different kind of story written by William Faulkner. The name of the story is Dry September. It is a much requested video and I will try my best to do justice to this piece. First we are going to go through a little bit about Faulkner's life and then we'll move to the story where we will take up the most important portions, read them like line by line, explain it to you. And finally we will talk about the major themes and issues and characters that we should focus on when studying this story. Don't skip any part of this video and if you like our videos, do consider subscribing to us. This is Monami Mukherjee. Welcome once again. William Cuthbert Faulkner. He was born in September. He was born on September 25th, 1897. You have stories by Faulkner in your paper which focuses on American writers. So he was an American writer and his works mostly center around Mississippi. He is considered to be one of the most celebrated writers of American literature and he won the Nobel Prize too. Dry September is one of his characteristic works where you can understand the ways in which uh, he looked at stories, uh, especially in context of the new world, new changing world. So although he was born in the 19th century, his life was all about the changes happening in the 20th century. Another thing you should keep in mind is that, uh, see, uh, the US or America in general is a huge space. And if you think that all American writers uh, write on similar themes or, or based on similar regions, then you're making the same mistake as the people who think that all Indian writers write in a similar way. So when you are dealing with a paper on American literature in general, you have to bring out not only the general characteristics of these writers, but the individualism. So that will give you an idea about the variety that each writer offers to, uh, you see, this mainstream called American literature. When Faulkner was writing, America was growing as a, as a world leader. It was not yet a world leader like it is today. The story we are going to look at, it was published in 1931 in a magazine. So what was America like in that period? It was not the Second World War yet, but as we know that America grew to prominence during the phase leading up to the Second World War. During the First World War, uh, it was more like a bystander comparatively. Therefore, what we can see is Faulkner might have faced the same kind of challenges uh, that Arnold was facing when in England was emerging as a world power during the Victorian times. So whenever a nation emerges as a very powerful one, uh, the thinkers, the writers, the philosophers of uh, that place, you know, they suffer a lot because they begin to understand the hypocrisy of progress. And in Faulkner's writings, as we will see in this story, Dry September, there is a lot of hypocrisy that society represents and the more prosperous people are, the more away from real human emotions they become. Okay, so we have this kind of a conflict uh, leading to greatest of literatures uh, throughout history of literature. We have seen that in Faulkner is no exception. So through his uh, long and celebrated literary career, he died in 1962, Faulkner establishes a pattern, a system, a form uh, which makes him unique in a way and also American in a way. Okay, so we will first read the story and just before I start the story, let me give you this interesting fact. The spelling of Faulkner when he was born, uh, it didn't have that U in it. Somebody made a typing error 
uh, in one of his certificates and Faulkner didn't mind the inclusion of the U and he continued to be F-A-U. All right, so uh, now let's go to the story itself. This story is based just like in case of uh, Faulkner's other stories in the Mississippi region. The story is there is this black man, colored man, who had assaulted a white woman. Now this is a rumor, we don't know if it's true. Based on that rumor, uh, people get very excited and angry and they decide to attack this uh, miscreant and they flock together and they attack the person. And on the other hand, we are shown uh, the life of this woman in question uh, who is uh, just past her prime youth. Now she is in her late thirties. So there is this situation from where things happen the way things usually happened. The white men dominating the black men and disregarding any kind of uh, idea of fair trial or anything. It's like a vigilante justice they want to have and they assault the man, kill the man eventually. And we are given an open-ended um, text where we do not know at the end of the story uh, whether there was any assault or not. What we see is that the white woman in question also goes through a kind of a weird breakdown. I'll not uh, read all the lines of the story. I don't want to spoon feed you. I'll guide you through this. I'll read uh, maybe some paragraphs. I will analyze them. And I want you to read the whole story. Don't skip anything there. After you finish watching this video, get the text and don't wait for long. You know, you start immediately so that this memory stays fresh in your mind and you can easily read the whole story. It's not a very big story. It's quite readable and it's a beautiful language we have. We are very simple language. Uh, Faulkner is easy to read because he writes about real human beings in real human context, which you can definitely understand. Okay, so let's start with the first part. This story is divided into five parts unequal parts not equal some part is very short some part is long each part deals with one aspect of the story okay so we will look at the first part now it's like drama act one so this setting is a barber's shop and the name of the barber is hawkshaw through the bloody september twilight aftermath of 62 rainless days it had gone like a fire in dry grass. The story begins with the description of the atmosphere, the weather. It's a dry September twilight. Twilight is the time uh, when the sun sets and there's this faint light on the horizon and it's looking bloody, reddish. Okay, so it's a very beautiful description. Although from the very first line, we get this feeling of dryness, rainless nights. So the weather is kind of very oppressive. It suffocates. And we will see how this undercurrent of suffocation runs throughout the story, which is introduced in the very first line itself. And the very first line starts to justify the title. This is about a September night and it is about a dry September night. Something about Miss Minnie Cooper and a Negro. He is using this word Negro. Nowadays we do not use this word. We use the word colored man, not even black man. Okay, Because the word Negro is associated with a lot of oppression. Negro is a term which white people used to discriminate against people whose skin color was not white. So therefore, it is a derogatory term, although uh, in poems like the Negro speaks of rivers, a uh, black man, he himself calls himself a Negro because he thinks that his identity as a black man is his pride and a word 
is there to establish that pride. We will maybe someday read that poem together. Let's come back to this story. So we have a story about Miss Minnie Cooper and a black man. Attacked, insulted, frightened. Who is attacked, insulted and frightened? The woman. Now this is not mentioned here. There are two uh, individuals mentioned in the previous sentence, Mini Cooper and Negro. And then he just gives us three adjectives, attacked, insulted, frightened. And we automatically think that definitely the woman is attacked, the woman is insulted, the woman is frightened. Because a Negro cannot be attacked, a Negro cannot be frightened, and a Negro cannot be insulted. Negroes are too dark and evil uh, and therefore whenever there is a story involving a white woman and a black man it is always always the white woman who must have been the victim okay so this is what Faulkner does is playing with his readers he will make his readers automatically understand who the victim is and then we become the same perpetrators of crime. We are also discriminating. See, we are automatically thinking that definitely the Negro is the person doing the crime and the white woman is the victim. None of them gathered in the barber shop on that Saturday evening where the ceiling fan stirred without freshening it, the vitiated air. So, see the narrative now. He is now describing the barber shop where some people have gathered and they are talking, this happens like in a regular shop when people go and they discuss about things happening around their society. So people have gathered there but none of them and then he gives a lot of clauses. First he is describing the ceiling fan which is stirring but it is not freshening the air. What kind of air? The vitiated air, the unclean air, the polluted air, sending back upon them in recurrent surges of stale pomade and lotion because it's a barber shop it's like a beauty parlor for men there are a lot of lotions and things uh, which uh, people use in grooming so that air was very suffocating and it had a lot of different kinds of scents or perfumes from different kinds of bottles their own stale breath and odors so this is where the clause ends or the series of clauses end and then what does Faulkner write knew exactly what had happened. So remove the clauses and then read the sentence. None of them knew exactly what had happened. So in between these two parts of the sentence, what the writer is doing, he is putting in elements where he is describing this whole scenario, this suffocating September evening. And therefore, somehow we begin to think there is a connection between this suffocation of the actual air around you or actual atmosphere around you and the suffocation of the lives of the people who talk about things but they do not know about things. Except it wasn't Will Mays, a barber said. He was a man of middle age. Now the narrative shifts his focus to a barber there, it's a barber's shop. Who does not think that Will Mayers has done anything wrong? Who is Will Mayers? Will Mayers is a black man, he is a Negro and people have started to feel that he is responsible for the attack. Okay, So the Negro in question is Will Mayers according to people's discussion. But the barber said that no, Will has not done it Okay, according to what he feels. Now, the writer begins to describe this barber, okay, thinks that Will Mace has not done anything. He was a man of middle age, a thin, sand-colored man. So, his color was a little bit of a golden uh, yellowish color with a mild face who was shaving a client. So, this barber was walking. I know Will Mace. He is a good nigger. Nigger is uh, a different way of saying Negro. But here when he is using the word Nigger, he is not actually deliberately disrespecting a man. He is very casual and it's almost endearing the way he says it. He is a good Nigger and I know Miss Minnie Cooper too. 
So you see, usually how do we compliment a person? We say that he is a good man or he is a, a good person or she is a good woman. But when it comes to a black man, he is never identified as a man. He is always identified as a Negro, as a nigger. Even by people who think that they are good. And I know Miss Winnie Cooper too. What do you know about her? A second barber said. Now, gossip is something which really generates a lot of excitement. Whenever somebody starts talking about a person in neighborhood, another person chips in. And this, this escalates, this goes on increasing uh, in momentum. Now, a client he gets interested in the whole conversation. Who is she? A young girl? No, the Baba said. She's about 40, I reckon. She ain't married. That's why I don't believe. See, this barber who thinks that Will Myers has not done anything. Why does he think so? He thinks so because this woman is not married. And this woman is almost 40. So she is not attractive. So why should anybody bother attacking her or trying to take advantage of her? She is not even young. So just at the moment when we are thinking that this barber at least has some consideration for human values because he thinks that a black man has not done it, the moment he gives his reason, we see that he has a different kind of a problem. He is here objectifying women. And classifying this woman, this particular woman, as a, as a person who is not desirable. Based on what? Based on whether she is married or not, whether she is 40 or not, or whether she is young or not. So this is what Faulkner will do. He will give you real human beings. He will not give you heroes. He will not give you uh, people who do not exist in real life. Because heroism in 1931 oh, was a very questionable thing itself. Believe hell, a hulking youth in a sweat stained silk shirt said. Won't you take a white woman's word before a nigger's? Now just the moment when the barber said that I don't think Will Myers has done it because this woman is not desirable. Suddenly a young man, he bounces in and says, I believe this white woman because she is a white woman. I don't believe any black man. So this person is on this superhuman level of racism where he is saying that it is by default that white people should be trusted and black people should not be. This is what this person is saying. I don't believe Will Myers did it. Now the barber is not saying that I don't believe any black man has done it. He is talking particularly about Will Myers. So he is also not altogether free from blame. He is not arguing uh, as if he is the champion of black people. He is saying Will Myers has not done it. One particular black man is not evil according to him. Maybe you know who did it then. Maybe you already got him out of town, you damn nigger lover. Now the moment he starts defending Will Myers, uh, others, they begin to call him names and they call him nigger lover. So he is supporting them. I don't believe anybody did anything. I don't believe anything happened. I leave it to you fellows, if them ladies that get old without getting married don't have notions that a man can't. So here he is continuously talking about why he thinks uh, this woman was not attacked and he thinks that this woman is somehow uh, not telling the truth. So Hawkshaw is establishing, Hawkshaw is this barber's name, Hawkshaw is establishing himself uh, as a rational person, as a principled man. But his defense is at the cost of uh, bringing down uh, women in general. That is not also totally acceptable. Then you are hell of a white man, the client said. He moved under the cloth. The youth had sprung to his feet. The youth is very excited. He wants to fight now. You don't? Do you accuse a white woman of lying? No, don't think that this young man is 
uh, very much running the feminist cause here. No, he is interested in this woman only because she is white. If a white man had attacked a black woman, nobody would have raised a finger. This is happening only because they think a black man has assaulted a white woman. So there is this tension growing, arguments rising. And then there is a strange thing that somebody says. It's this darn weather, another said. It's enough to make a man do anything, even to her. Look at the extent of humiliation here of this woman. She is undesirable, but this weather is so boring that people will even want to sleep with a boring woman. This is what this whole sentence means. And this is very insulting. They don't realize that while insulting or accusing this black man, their argument, their logic is basically insulting their white woman too. I don't think they are much bothered about women anyway. Nobody laughed. The barber said in his mild, stubborn tone, I ain't accusing nobody of nothing. I just know and you fellows know how a woman that never... Now he wants to again establish that this woman has never been married. So, well, the same logic comes here. You damn nigger lover, the youth said. Shut up, Butch, another said. We'll get the facts in plenty of time to act. So Butch is the name of this young man. He is always jumping around. Somebody asks Butch to keep quiet so that they can investigate the whole thing. Who are these people? Are they uh, from the police department? No, they are not official investigators. They are people who think they are in charge of society. And whenever there's a crime, they must go and act to rectify it. They don't need any government, they don't need any authorities and this tendency uh, to take uh, this whole law in your hands as a gesture of correcting society. This whole idea is called vigilante justice. Okay. So these people are uh, in favor of that it seems. Who is? Who is getting them? So Butch says that I don't think anybody is investigating even uh, facts, hell, you're a fine white man, the client said, aren't you? In his frothy beard, he looked like a desert rat in the moving pictures. You tell them, Jack, he said to the youth. If there aren't any white men in this town, you can count on me, even if I ain't only a drummer and a stranger. So this kind of conversation where they are constantly bringing in this reference uh, to whiteness of skin. We understand how conservative these people are and how much they judge a man based on their physical appearance. And then eventually the barber says, that's right boys, find out the truth first. I know Wilmice. Well, by God, the youth shouted to think that a white man in this town, again he uh, goes on jumping around establishing that he doesn't think any white man has done any crime. It's a black man's work. Shut up, Butch, the second speaker said. We got plenty of time. The client sat up. He looked at the speaker. Do you claim that anything excuses a nigger attacking a white woman? So everybody is trying to tell that if this dark-skinned person, if this negro is found to be the attacker, then he should not be spared. Because this is an insane crime when a black man hits a white man or when a black man assaults a white woman. That cannot be excused under any circumstance. And then he says, do you mean to tell me, he's talking to uh, our barber, who is supporting Wilmice? And he says, do you mean to tell me you are a white man and you will stand for it? You better go back north where you came from. The south don't want your kind here. So, as I was telling you, America is not one single place, homogeneous place. It's not that. It's a collection of different kinds of people, different kinds of regions, different kinds of dialects, different kinds of personalities, and different kinds of worldviews. South 
is more racist in a way as we see through these stories and the moment this barber is raising a voice in support of this black man he is branded as an outsider so an american white man calls another american white man an outsider based on the idea of racism so this was so powerfully ingrained in them that they didn't bother thinking twice before disowning a fellow white american that if you are supporting a negro we don't want you with us go back to your northern roots not what the second said i was born and raised in this town so maybe uh, this barber's forefathers they were from northern part of america he is born and brought up here so he feels that he belongs here but the moment he is supporting a black man it is said that he does not belong here so this idea of home the idea of identity rooted in a region this is something which america takes pride in so if you want to hit an american hard you tell them that you don't belong here and they take it very personally this is as if they feel the same kind of discrimination which a black man feels so anyway in this barber shop what we eventually see is that people are having this heated argument and most of them think that this black man must be punished in some way and this is not acceptable now while this argument is going on we have another man crashing in the screen door crashed open notice this uh, word crashed uh, just skip a few uh, lines you'll find this a man stood in the floor his feet apart and his heavy set body poised easily so the whole description is representative of a kind of confidence so we know that this man is a man of confidence and has a lot of social standing we feel so his posture is very masculine very composed his white shirt was open at the throat he wore a felt hat his hot bold glance swept the group so swept the group means he just looked at everybody like sweeping the floor okay so his look went on everybody his name was mcclendon he had commanded troops at the front in france and had been decorated for valor so he is a symbol of heroism heroism as we were talking about it well he said are you going to sit there and let a black son rape a white woman on the streets of jefferson he uses this word rape till now people only said attacked now is directly using the word rape and when he does that of course it changes dimension it changes uh, intensity the crime becomes worse right he doesn't bother to know any details he just says that a black man has raped a white woman and how can we just sit here and do nothing anyway hawkshaw continues to defend uh, my's innocence and suggests that they gather some evidence that let's let's get some evidence and go to the police but everybody wants to go with mcclendon to take laws in their own hands and serve justice uh, for this white woman now what hawkshaw does is very interesting he doesn't stay back in his shop he thinks that he should accompany them and try his best to at least stop them from killing the black man okay so he decides to go along with this group of very angry vigilantes part 2 brings us to this woman she was 38 or 39 the moment the pronoun she is used we instinctively understand that it is mary mary cooper because she had been in our minds all through the first part our curiosity about this woman is increased uh, by these facts that she is 40 she is not yet married 
and then we begin to ask ourselves questions like why is she not married what is her situation and second part answers our queries to some extent so we have a description of uh, mary cooper uh, she lived in a small frame house uh, with her invalid mother and a thin uh, sallow and flagging aunt where each morning between 10 and 11 she would appear on the porch of a lace trimmed budua cap to sit swinging on the porch swing until noon so she had a lazy day in a way and she spent her life mostly doing nothing she had his mother and aunt after dinner she lay down for a while until the afternoon began to cool again after dinner she would rest then in one of the three or four new royal dresses which she had each summer she would go downtown to spend the afternoon in the stores with the other ladies so she had a very dull life uh, where she did things uh, in a very uninspiring way you know getting up in the morning swinging about then having dinner going to sleep and then in the evening going out with friends going to shops not buying things where they would handle the goods and haggle over the prices in cold immediate voices without any intention of buying the other thing which i want you to look at in this description part is that physical appearance is in focus here her mother is described as invalid and then this aunt is described as thin sallow unflagging and then her whole uh, description is based on the things she does and the way she looks so later on we see that in-depth description of her psyche she watched the girls with whom she had grown up as they married and got homes and children she is not married but her friends have got married they have children now and she looks at them but no man ever called on her steadily until the children of the other girls had been calling her auntie for several years the while their mothers told them in bright voices about how popular aunt minnie had been as a girl therefore we have this vacant spot in her mind a kind of lack lacuna you can see where she is suffering because she is hiding from this society her real desire she wants a family she wants a husband and she has nothing so that is sad then the town began to see her driving on sunday afternoons with the cashier in the bank and then she had this affair with the bank's cashier he was a widower of about 40 a high colored man smelling always faintly of the barber shop or of whiskey so when was this happening this was happening in the past so faulkner will switch between flashbacks and flash forwards and he will play around with time uh, once he said that you know there is nothing called time time is not a real thing a uh, human beings experience of a moment is not one individual's experience it is the sum total of experiences of all human beings living that moment simultaneously that is time moments you spend with everybody else in the world is time this is something you said very very complicated idea anyway he thinks that time is something very fluid and in his narratives we have this constant shifting between frames of time past present future eliot wrote about this thing in his four quartets when he says about time in a very interesting way the time past but and time present are both contained in time future so here we have this description of a time when she had an affair with the cashier of a bank all right he owned the first automobile in town a red runabout minnie had the first motoring bonnet and veil the town ever saw 
so because she had an affair with this man who owned this first kind of uh, automobile in town she had to have proper hats and uh, accessories uh, to go on a ride with him so this was a time when as i was telling you america was changing and uh, owning a vehicle a motor vehicle was considered to be a great accomplishment it is still considered to be an accomplishment but back then it was like if you own an elephant now people would stare at you uh, it was the same kind of a thing then then the town began to say poor mini because this relationship didn't work out so we are given ideas about people based on what other people's talk about them like in the first part we actually do not know about will mais we do not know anything about will we know about will from whom from this barber we know about this white woman from the people who are gathering there in the barber shop and then in part 2 we get ideas about mini from the reactions of her friends from the reactions of the people who look at her affair and call her poor mini at the end because well it failed but she is old enough to take care of herself others said then it's okay things happen she'll move on that was when she began to ask her old school mates that their children call her cousin instead of auntie because when their children called her auntie she felt that she is branded as a as an old woman and people will not be interested in her anymore so the whole idea or the whole focus of being a woman is to get married so this was the case um, in 18th century 19th century and even now so the focus was to be desirable to men because that meant you have certain kind of security economic assurance that you will be taken care of so she didn't want others to think that she is very old and she wanted the children of her friends to call her cousin instead of auntie it was 12 years now she had been relegated into adultery by public opinion and 8 years since the cashier had gone to a memphis bank returning for one day each christmas which he spent at an annual bachelor's party at a hunting club on the river 12 years back she had this affair 8 years back she had this breakup and now this man he doesn't stay in this town he comes back only once a year to enjoy himself not with her but with his bachelor friends or his friends at a bachelor's party in a forest the sitting and lounging men did not even follow her with their eyes anymore so it is uncomfortable for a woman uh, when she walks down the street and people stare at her or ogle her but this whole situation is so sad and tragic that here she would rather want men to look at her with some kind of desire because now what is happening nobody even looks at her so she would have preferred them to stare at her look at her uh, pass some signals to her because that would make her feel desired wanted part 3 brings us back to hawkshaw so hawkshaw goes on telling them that will is not guilty and they are not ready to listen so what his point is is to just investigate the real facts all he wants is a fair trial and these people do not want that they want revenge when he overtook them mcclendon and three others were getting into a car parked in an alley so alley is this small path small way in which there was a car parked and mcclendon took these men with him uh, in this car McClendon stooped his thick head peering out beneath the top so McClendon is in the driving seat and he just pulls his head out of the window and looks at Hawkshaw and says changed your mind did you damn good thing by god tomorrow when this town hears about how you talked tonight 
So McClendon is saying that, okay, so you have changed your mind. You want to go with us and take revenge. Good, because otherwise everybody uh, will call you a Negro lover uh, if they get to know about how you defended Will tonight. Now, now, the other ex-soldier said, Hawkshaw is all right. Come on, Hawk, jump in. So they want to include Hawkshaw because they don't want any white man to defend a black man. Will Myers never done it, boys, the barber said. He's still going on saying this. If anybody done it, why? You all know well as I do, there aren't any town where they got better niggers than us. So he's saying that we have best Negroes, we have best black men. Other towns black men are bad, our black men are good. <laughs> so his logic is also a convoluted one but he's trying desperately anyway to ensure that will is not attacked. So he's saying that our Negroes are good Negroes so we should not harm them. And you know how a lady will kind of think things about men when there aren't any reason to. And Miss Minnie anyway, he's going on insulting Minnie. Okay. Sure, sure. We are just going to talk to him a little. So the soldier says, I don't worry. We'll, we'll just go and talk to this Will. Talk hell. When we are through with the... So from the tone, we understand that Butch and these people, they are not actually going to talk to Will Myers. They are going to kill Will Myers. Anyway, so they simply move on. There's a second car also, which means that this is like a teamwork. And McClendon has made this plan beforehand, before entering the barber shop, because he had coordinated with the second car also, so that they are going together to attack Will. So they head towards this factory where Will worked. They drove on out of town. They reach their factory and, well, they drag him out and somehow decide that this man should not be living. But they don't want to kill him there. Not here. Get him into the car. Kill him. Kill the black son, the voice murmured. So these people, they were gathered around this, uh, this body of this black man lying passively on this ground. So this passivity of the black body this powerlessness and these people brooding over this black body like destiny. This is the real picture of a racist America, which Americans of 21st century are not proud of. This is what they're fighting against every moment, this kind of racism. Just like Indians, we are not proud of the casteism, the untouchabilities. So when we look at moments like this, don't think that America is not a great nation. But these are the blemishes, just like the moon has blemishes. So these are the blemishes which a, which a nation needs to you know, win over or remove. And what is the first step to remove a blemish, to recognize a blemish as a blemish? To recognize an evil as an evil. So these stories written and published in 1931, 1934, 1938, these stories helped in identification of these blemishes, of these negativities, identification of this racist attitude. And out of that identification came the realization that this has to be done away with. Because hating a black man, discriminating against a black man was a normalized thing. If you didn't do that, you were out of the whole pack. You were a loner, you were, you were thrown out of that group. And group gives a kind of security. So literature does this. It identifies the evils of society. And then come the actions and reactions and reactionaries who fight and who, who really bring about the real change. But literature reveals what has to be changed and this has to be changed. This black man is put inside this car. The reaction of Hawkshaw is, is, is feeling very powerless here. 
The barber had waited beside the car. He could feel himself sweating and he knew he was going to be sick at the stomach. And then he was not moving, this black man. What you all going to do with me, Mr. John? I ain't done nothing. So he knows Hawkshaw by name. And he says that what's going to happen to me? He's scared. I ain't done nothing. White folks, captains, I ain't done nothing. I swear for God, he called another name. And then he was forced inside the car and they start driving. Hawkshaw, he can't take it anymore. And he wants to just be out of this situation. Let me out, John, he said. Jump out, nigger lover. The Negro feels that this man, Hawkshaw, is the only person who has some reason, some logic in him and some compassion in him and he wants him to stay in the car. But the barber began to tug furiously at the door, so he's trying to get out of this moving car. Look out there, the soldier said, but the barber had already kicked the door open and swung onto the running board. The soldier leaned across the Negro and grasped at him, but he had already jumped. The car went on without checking speed. Nobody stopped for Hawkshaw. He simply jumped out. The impetus, impetus means when you, when you have a fall like this from a car, you have a, uh, an opposite reaction from the ground. The impetus hurled him, crashing through dust sheathed weeds into the ditch. He falls. He went on limping. So he wants to protect Will, but he is unable to do that. And right now, he himself is badly hurt. He went on limping. Presently, he heard cars and the glow of them grew in the dust behind him. And he left the road and crouched again in the weeds until they passed. McClendon's car came last now. There were four people in it and Butch was not on the running board. So he saw that the car returns and the Negro is not there. So they must have killed him and dumped him somewhere. They went on. The dust swallowed them. The glare and the sound died away. The dust of them hung for a while. But soon the eternal dust absorbed it again. The barber climbed back onto the road and limped on toward town. So it shows kind of futility of humanity is limping. If Hawkshaw is representing man, as in human, then humanity is failing here, limping here, okay? How many times do we have the word dust in the last stanza? The dust swallowed them, the dust of them hung for a while, and then we have eternal dust. So you see how human actions are closely knit with nature, closely knit with your ambience, your natural ambience. And how the dryness of September is continuing, even when September is not mentioned anymore. So this dryness is not just about the dryness of the earth or the dryness of the air, the dryness of human soul. People incapable of compassion, they become dry. And when you have something very dry, it cannot be fertile. So only through compassion can you have renewal, can you have humanity? Can you have prosperity? When it is dry, you cannot have anything. In India, it's very hard to imagine a dry September because Septembers are wet. They are the wettest months. So we do have to apply a lot of imagination when you think about dry September. It's like an oxymoron in India, not in America, not where uh, this writer is located. There, in those savannas, that's real dry. People die out there. They might not be deserts like Rajasthan, but people die in savannas when it's really, really dry. And during these months when rains fail. Fourth part brings us back to Minnie Cooper. As she dressed for supper on that Saturday evening, her own flesh felt like fever. When is this? This is like 
since we are very concerned about time here uh, we need to understand which one is future tense which one is past tense which one is present tense this is about today this is about present times okay after will mice is attacked all right as she dressed for supper on that saturday evening her own flesh felt like fever she was feeling hot and feverish her hands trembled among the hooks and eyes and her eyes had a feverish look if those white men are right then she had a traumatic experience she was attacked right by a black man so it's natural for her to have a feverish reaction what if that event did not happen what if this whole thing was a story in that case it could be a way in which she was trying to get some attention because this incident with will or this rumor with this black man has brought some attention back to her which she didn't have for years and maybe she was a little excited for it now her friends come over help her get ready friends show curiosity they really want to know what had happened it's a very spicy story for them she is silent she is not talking about that incident they go out like the usual and then there is this description they entered the square she in the center of the group notice that she is now in the center of the group so she is getting all the attention now fragile in her fresh dress i love the way in which faulkner uses alliteration he is the king alliterator i say uh, you have this alliteration in fragile in her fresh dress alliteration is when you use um, any consonant sound uh, repetitively in a sentence and here in this case this becomes more uh, sonorous because you have not just f but fr repeated fragile in her fresh dress she was trembling worse she walked slower and slower as children eat ice cream her head up and her eyes bright in the haggard banner of her face passing the hotel and the coatless drummers in chairs along the curb looking around at her people are looking at her now that's the one see the one in pink in the middle is that her what did they do to the nigger did they sure he is all right all right is he sure he went on a little trip people are discussing in hushed voices about her about the black man about what could have happened to that black man and then somebody is saying that no no he is not killed he is just sent away so look at the kind of the culture of gossip and gossip defining actions of people gossips judging actions of people then the drug store where even the young men lounging in the doorway tipped their hats so they were wearing hats so when they saw mini cooper they just tipped their hats in recognition in respect so a paradigm shift on attitudes of people they are now looking at her with interest and followed with their eyes the motion of her hips and legs when she passed and they didn't just show respect to her they were actually seeing her why because now they were wondering a negro attacked her maybe we are missing something maybe there is something interesting in her so this is how attitude changes and we begin to ask ourselves this question that could it have been the case that this whole thing this whole incident was invented by mini cooper just to get this kind of attention because when you want to get society's attention you place yourself as a victim and when you do that if you accuse a white man then uh, you won't get any help from society but if you accuse a black man society will take up arms in favor of you and also give you some extra attention so to get that extra attention mini cooper might have invented the whole story or maybe she was attacked by somebody but not will what is interesting is that 
they went on passing the lifted hats of the gentlemen the suddenly ceased voices when people were seeing them they stopped talking looked at them with interest different protective do you see now she was walking with her friends so her friends are now addressing her do you see there is not a negro on the square not one why because the black people the colored people they are frightened they have seen that just based on mere accusation no fact checking is done and a black man is killed so there is no sense of security in them they are not standing anywhere near a white man in this town because they feel vulnerable so if we go to the three adjectives we found in part 1 the three adjectives were attacked insulted frightened in the course of this story we see that the person who is attacked insulted and frightened is not the white woman but the black man so this is how faulkner is actually rewriting the story of america he is rewriting these ideas all right he is hitting hard with these adjectives and our notions now while they are moving about in uh, in a shopping around they reach the picture show it's a movie theater of those days it was like a miniature fairy land with its lighted lobby and colored lithographs of life caught in its terrible and beautiful mutations so what does a movie hall represent it represents a kind of a fairy land an escape and mini wants an escape from the boredom of her life anyway she goes uh, with her friends to this uh, fairy land to this movie house and then while they were watching this screen people were coming and sitting suddenly she had this urge to laugh mini could not control herself and she started to laugh and it was not an ordinary laugh it was uncontrolled almost frenzied like a fit she began to laugh in trying to suppress it it made more noise than ever heads began to turn when you suppress a laugh you make weird sounds so everybody was staring at her now still laughing but like she, she couldn't stop herself so her friends raised her and led her out and she stood at the curb laughing on a high sustained note this was not laughter this is like a complete breakdown it's as if uh, she was holding on to something and something broke inside her so this makes me wonder that if she was having a breakdown why was she having a breakdown inside the movie theater why didn't she have the breakdown after the incident if the incident had happened so was this breakdown not because of any incident was there no incident was this breakdown because of the reaction of people she starts to laugh that now you find me desirable now that i am assaulted by a nigger or we don't know maybe it was really maybe really will did something or some black man did something or some white man did something something terrible to her and trauma has uh, strange kinds of after effects it doesn't have to be uh, immediately after any incident but it can always come up later maybe while watching the movie she had some kind of a deja vu some kind of a uh, of a response from inside and she reacted with laughter her friends brought her home and put some ice to bring her fever down to calm her down the doctor was hard to locate so they ministered to her with hushed ejaculations renewing the eyes and fanning her now notice that this is a deliberate juxtaposition of opposite things you have a dry september there and you have ice and coldness you had ice cream earlier so ice is brought in as an agent that soothes you as against the dryness but this soothing uh, power of ice is temporary it doesn't stay the ice cream it, it doesn't stay forever the ice packs on her head 
they are not working as a permanent solution while the ice was fresh and cold she stopped laughing and lay still for a time moaning only a little but soon the laughing welled again and her voice rose screaming note the word screaming so laughter changing to screams now despair friends are very concerned at the same time they are very curious shh, shh they said freshening the ice pack smoothing her hair examining it for gray see this is so faulkner uh, they they are taking care of their friend and while doing that when they are moving their fingers along her head they are trying to see if there is any gray hair why because this is what matters in society how many gray hairs you have how old are you are you married are you seeing any men at now are you with any man right now or are you single and therefore you are undesirable so all these complex things go on so do her friends love her i don't call this love but this is also love they are with her they are giving her time they are giving her attention and they are giving her a lot of curious glances too and then they said poor girl then to one another now they are talking to each other do you suppose anything really happened see they are our closest friends and they don't know anything their eyes darkly a glitter secret and passionate shh poor girl poor mini they love to gossip and it doesn't really matter whether something happened or not because well worst case a black man dies who cares the gossip should go on the fifth part usually a uh, fifth act is a conclusive one we have all the important characters on stage we have all the intensity resolved at the end so how does faulkner present the final part of his story it was midnight when maclinden drove up to his neat new house maclinden is going to be the focus of the final part maclinden who is not the central character well there is no central character here let's let's just be straight about it in the first part the focus is on the barber second part it's on mini third part is on the incident where we have the attack on will where we still say that the focus is on the barber and uh, the way he reacts fourth part is again on mini so fifth part is on maclinden this is what faulkner does in many of his stories we do not have any fixed point of reference whenever there is a straight narrative with a focused characters or a central characters then usually we begin to sympathize with the central character even when the central character is what let's say um is a serial killer we begin to find out uh, something good about that character if the uh, writer presents that character as the central character i'm not just talking about dexter i'm talking about macbeth he's also a serial killer isn't he so when you don't have a central character or one single central character then the whole narration becomes a non linear one you can say you do not know whom to believe you do not know whom to sympathize with you do not know who is telling the truth and who is lying and this leads to something called unreliable narrator you stop relying on the narrator because the narrator says that the truth cannot be known truth is an illusion people simply do not want that they want to gossip and decide and brand people as good or bad they are hardly bothered about reality they are hardly bothered about truth so we have the story of maclinden concluding this whole story he has a neat new house it was trim and fresh as a bird cage note this word bird cage so his house is like a prison prison for who prison for maclinden of course not and almost as small with its clean green and white paint he locked the car and mounted the porch and entered 
His wife rose from a chair beside the reading lamp. So his wife is waiting and we can guess who the bird is in his bird cage. McClendon stopped in the floor and stared at her until she looked down. Look at that clock, he said, lifting his arm, pointing. McClendon didn't want his wife to stay up. He wanted to come back home and just go to sleep. He sees that his wife is waiting and he is irritated and he says, what, what time is it? She stood before him, her face lowered. Look at the body language here. A magazine in her hands. Her face was pale, strained and weary looking. She was looking very tired. Haven't I told you about sitting up like this, waiting to see when I come in? McClendon is accusative and he says that, oh, you're spying on me when I come back. John, she doesn't speak much. Didn't I tell you? And then what does he do? He caught her shoulder. She stood passive, looking at him like she's used to this. This happens all the time. Don't, John, I couldn't sleep. The heat. See, the weather is coming again in the narrative. Something, please, John, you're hurting me. Didn't I tell you? He released her and half struck, half flung her across the chair. And she lay there and watched him quietly as he left the room. So he, McClendon is, is called a celebrated hero. He's basically a violent bully, a wife beater, a domestic abuser. So when he goes out and kills a black man because he thinks that the black man has attacked a white woman, he is not doing because he wants to protect women. He is doing that because he loves beating black men and loves killing them. So it's an excuse for him. Racism looks for excuses everywhere. So this story is not just about the humiliation of black men. This is about the humiliation of women. Minnie Cooper, look at her life. She is humiliated all through her life. By whom? By her own friends who are women. He went on through the house, ripping off his shirt and on the dark screened porch at the rear, he stood and mopped his head and shoulders with the shirt and flung it away. So, so wet with perspiration, he wiped himself. He took the pistol from his hip. He always carries this pistol as a symbol of violence, foreboding, and laid it on the table beside the bed and sat on the bed and removed his shoes and rose and slipped his trousers off. He was undressing for sleep. He was sweating again already and he stopped and hunted furiously for the shirt. He could not sleep because of course it was a very dry night. At last he found it and wiped his body again and with his body pressed against the dusty screen, he stood panting. There was no movement, no sound, not even an insect. Lack of life, lack of vitality. Because when September is this dry, you do not have crickets chirping. We do not have insects. We do not have any kind of positive life force out there. The dark world seemed to lie stricken beneath the cold moon and the lidless stars. So the continuation of violence, apathy, hypocrisy. And look at these words, cold moon, lidless stars. Stars are blinking and they do not have any lids on them. Like we have eyelids, when we sleep, we put our lids down. The stars cannot sleep, the moon cannot sleep, and it's cold as against the heat. But this coldness of the moon is not comforting because this coldness comes with lifelessness. There is no life on the moon. And the stars, they cannot sleep because they don't have any lids to close their eyes. So we have some very key moments in this whole story and you have a parallel plot structure. You have one plot running where uh, you have this barber shop attack on Myers and then you have McClendon who is uh, this representation of social injustice you can see representation of violence 
and the second part or the second plot it, it is about Minnie's life and Minnie's breakdown and they are juxtaposed because in reality things are not in watertight compartments they are always coming together here also things come together what is very interesting is that if you look at the plot structure I was telling you that two parts are given to Hawkshaw two parts are given to Minnie and one whole part is given to McClendon. Where is Will? Which part is there for Will? Where does he speak? Where does he get to speak? Nowhere. This is because Faulkner understood that he cannot allot a whole part to this black man because society never allowed that space to them or that facility of voicing out. So this is how he is playing with this whole plot structure to accommodate the nuances of the society he is writing on. And this concept of there is no central character this is also very important here. Uh, it begins with the barber, ends with the bully. Uh, it's a story about a crime which is not clearly disclosed even. We don't know what happened. For me, the central character is society and antagonistically placed is the nature. It's like the sea in Riders to the Sea. It's like Egden Heath in Hardy. You have in Faulkner a lot of nature surrounding these human beings, this society and interfering as if with the workings of human society. So there is an objectification of black man, objectification of woman, objectification of the empathizer, somebody who has some sympathy for the black man, even that person is, is objectified. In the novel To Kill a Mockingbird, you have a very similar incident. But there we have a fighting back and a white man is fighting back. We have a real hero there, Atticus Finch. If you ever get to see the movie The Green Mile. Uh, it's a beautiful movie where we have Tom Hanks acting. You will see what discrimination looks like and how powerless the empathizers feel. Please do watch that movie. The central symbols, if we look at them, well, the heat itself is a symbol of oppression and we have ice set against it. Gun is a symbol of violence of masculinity, domination and we have handcuffs when Will is captured they put handcuffs on him so we don't have one black man in handcuffs we have this whole generation of black people enslaved even after they are freed so enslavement runs deep in the subconscious and that is the root of racism the title it creates anticipation in us and at the same time it, it represents the dryness, the monotony, the boredom of a social structure where people would rather go and kill another man just to do something about it, to break that boredom, to break the monotony. Faulkner once said, I write about the human heart in conflict with itself its fellows with its environment. This is something we see in Hardy as I was telling. So man in conflict with man and not another man but himself. This is Faulkner's idea that narrative progresses through this conflict. Without conflict, no progression. Blake said that. So here in this story, the conflict is not just between McClendon and Hawkshaw, but within Hawkshaw and Hawkshaw. Okay, so one Hawkshaw who wants to fight till the end, one Hawkshaw who decides to jump out of the car because he can't take it anymore. One Mini Cooper who hates being stared at, who starts laughing and reacting, and one Mini Cooper who had bought that bonnet to ride on this fine motor vehicle owned by her boyfriend, this cashier from bank. So these 
people in conflict with each other in conflict with their own selves this is what faulkner's story is about and this is what america is also about america a young nation a very young nation almost in its teenage years now i guess if you compare it with countries like india this conflict within the self is very very evident and the first step to resolve this conflict is to recognize it and that is what faulkner does here and i hope uh, you can come up with great answers and papers on this story do share with me any problems you come across or any questions you want me to answer i once again thank you for being with us see you all in my next video till then stay happy stay subscribed this is pranam mukherjee signing off